So for post-operative patients, the education is done before the surgery, in the preoperative phase, right? You got to remember a couple of basic things that whenever the patient's under general anesthesia, who breathes better? The machine that's breathing for the patient or us? The answer is us. We breathe better. We do the best thing when it comes to the respiratory effort because every few breaths, what do we do? We take a, 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 an increased inspiratory effort, right? That really expands the alveoli, gets the gases exchanged. And also, what do we do every couple breaths? We, <coughs> we clear our airways. However, for the post-operative patient, they've been under general anesthesia and they've been doing no, no such thing. So it's important for us to consider the following. In your post-operative period, you're always assessing the ABCs, the airway, breathing, and circulation. We address the airway by educating the patient to <coughs> cough and deep breathe. We cough to mobilize secretions. A lot of pulmonary stasis may develop, and you may develop mucus plugs. And those mucus plugs may become or may develop atelectasis. And atelectasis is lung collapse due to usually a mucus plug. So that's why we have the patient cough. We have the patient deep breathe to expand the alveoli. The alveoli has been sitting there just kind of hanging out with potential fluids, mucus within the confines of the tissues. So we have the patient cough, deep breathe, utilize the incentive spirometer to get them to, to, get them to expand and to promote that gas exchange, the elimination of carbon dioxide and the intake of oxygen. Also, we educate the patient on circulatory issues or the prevention of venous stasis. And venous stasis is what happens when the blood pools because of a lack of movement. As you guys can see in this brief illustration, this right here represents the calf muscles. And generally speaking, you want to have the patient ambulate in the immediate post-op period, if possible. But there are some circumstances, for instance, if the patient has a very aggressive procedure, such as a hip arthroplasty, the doctor or the physical therapist will set the parameters as to when we're going to be ambulating the patient. The goal is to ambulate them as early as possible. But because of the limitations, because of the surgical procedure, sometimes we can't get them out of bed within the first hour. What we want to provide is some type of compression devices. The compression devices, what they do is they mimic muscle contraction, they mimic ambulation, and they squeeze, they put pressure on the veins. And that pressure allows the blood to move back towards the heart. And that's the whole purpose of the contraction, the early ambulation. But initially, which we'll discuss in just a bit, you want to go ahead and ensure that the patient has something on them already so it can compress the legs, compress the muscles, compress the veins, and promote venous return. Also, you want to keep in mind the first 24 to 48 hours after a procedure. Remember, guys, ABCs is always priority. That's the truth. But if the issue is not airway, breathing, or circulation, then you want to look for the first 24 to 48 hours potentials for bleeding. You want to make note of those time frames. They tell you the patient is 36 hours post-op, 15 hours post-op. Pay attention to those phrases because outside of ABCs, you're looking at potential bleeding. Any indication, maybe a, a trend of an increase in the heart rate, Maybe the level of consciousness changes. Maybe you have sudden severe pain. Acute pain is usually an indicator that something's happening inside one of the body cavities and there's blood filling up that cavity. So you always want to pay attention to that for the first 24 to 48 hours. I will re-emphasize the point that airway, breathing, circulation is always priority regardless of the time frame. However, if the question that you're being asked is talking about the post-operative period and it's not addressing anything dealing with airway or breathing. Circulation falls into this first 24 to 48 hours with a potential for bleeding. Remember, restlessness is also an indication of tissue hypoxia, which happens when you're bleeding. Then the next 48 to 72 hours, the most common complication in that time frame is going to be the potential for infection. So you want to keep in mind to looking out for indicators that suggest that there's some type of infection going on, whether it's purulent drainage, whether it's a foul smelling odor, or whether it's an elevated white blood cell count, or tenderness or rubor around the edges of the incision site. All of those are indications that the patient may be developing an infection and you want to go ahead and intervene accordingly or you want to report. Now, when you guys get questions and it says the initial intervention, they're telling you this for a reason. When we talk about initial interventions, they're usually least invasive. What I mean by that is how do you promote the patient from 
not developing DVTs? Well, the fastest way is to ambulate the patient if the time frames allow. Secondly, if you can't do that, you're not going to massage the leg. You're going to apply some Ted Ho stockings or some pneumatic compression devices. So keep in mind that when we talk about the initial intervention, we're talking about least invasive and we're talking about independent actions that the patient can carry out on his or her own so we don't have to worry about having to create orders or for prolonging the time frame that the patient needs to wait for them to actually have an intervention to promote circulation. You also want to consider the word priority. Anytime you see the word priority, which of the following would be your priority? At that point, the rule is we utilize ABCs. Is there anything that's addressing airway, breathing, circulation, the elements that we've just discussed, not only exclusively to the post-operative period, but just any patient that you're taking care of, when they tell you what is your priority intervention given the subject matter, always consider airway, breathing, circulation. If it's not addressing those elements, then we move on to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs initially, you know, it's that, ups, it's that pyramid, right? And we have a variety of elements that we must complete before we move on to the next section. So the first one would be physiological elements. Anything that deals with physiology, we address those first. Then we talk about safety, uh, safety and security. After we address physiological issues, then we can move on to safety and security issues. Sometimes they won't even ask you anything that deals with physiology. The issue is basically just safety, so then we address that. But this is a tool that we use. If safety is not the issue, we address love and belongingness, then we address self-esteem issues, and lastly, self-actualization. So keep in mind that anytime you're dealing with a question that says priority intervention, it's dealing with these elements, ABCs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we always address acute issues before chronic issues. If you keep in mind these basic elements, guys, it's going to be a lot easier for you to break down the question and know how to intervene accordingly.